This is the second section of my course on restructured electricity markets, locational marginal pricing. In this section on simultaneous equations, we'll discuss formulation, examples, the basic newton raphson algorithm to solve such problems, and we'll discuss that newton raphson algorithm in detail. There'll also be some homework exercises. Simultaneous equations problems arise whenever we have conservation. Conservation of current flow, power flow, for example. The equations may be linear or nonlinear. We're going to see in section 3 that the power flow problem is a collection, can be formulated as a collection of simultaneous nonlinear equations. To specify our system of equations, we need to think about a decision vector. It's chosen from a domain. The domain in our case will be n-dimensional Euclidean space. I'll denote that by r to the n. r means the set of real numbers. r to the n is the set of n-tuples of real numbers. In other words, the set of n vectors where each entry of the vector is a real number. I'm usually going to use a symbol such as x to denote the decision vector with entries in x denoted by subscripts. So xk will be the kth entry of x. Later on in some problem formulations, we're going to need a slightly more complicated notation, and we'll interpret xk as itself a vector. But for now, xk is just a real number. For now, x is a generic decision vector. We won't be very explicit about the interpretation of its entries. But later on, for example, in section 3, when we cover power flow, we will explicitly define the entries of x. Similarly, in economic dispatch, in section 5, we'll make another definition of the entries of x. Since that definition will vary with the problem, the length of the vector and its entries are going to vary with the problem context. So for now, we'll keep it generic. As well as a decision vector, we need a vector function. I'll call it g. It takes values from the domain r to the n and returns values of the function in a range space r to the m. That is to say, it has values that are m vectors. As a notational device, and I'll keep using this throughout the course, so if you're not familiar with it, you might want to note it down. When I want to indicate that a particular symbol stands for a function, I'll write that symbol, g, colon, then the domain space, an arrow to the range space. And you could pronounce that g goes from r to the n into r to the m. Just as with the decision vector, I'll need to think about entries of the function g, and they'll be denoted also by subscripts. So g subscript l is the lth entry. Vector functions can be linear, meaning a matrix A times a vector, g of x is equal to ax. They can be affine. Sometimes when we're speaking loosely, we refer to affine functions as linear. But, per, but to be precise, a linear function is one that I, as defined, g of x is equal to ax. An affine function is a function that is defined in terms of a matrix and a vector g of x is affine if it's equal to ax minus b. By the way, that upside down a in the, in the equation there set means for all. I'm simply defining the all of the values of g for all possible values of its argument. We can also have polynomial or nonlinear functions. Just as with the decision vector, g will be generic, except in the examples. The only thing I'm going to assume about g is that I can differentiate each of its entries with respect to any one of the arguments. In other words, I'm going to assume that g is partially differentiable. So a simultaneous equations problem means finding a value of x that satisfies gx equal to 0. To distinguish a generic value of x from the particular value that solves my equations, I'll typically denote it 
with a superscript star. Notice that this is a five-pointed star. Later on, we'll need to deal with complex conjugates, and I'll have a very similar notation. Hopefully, it'll be easy to tell the difference. If g is affine, then we have equations ax minus b equals 0. We usually rearrange it to say ax equals b. And these are called simultaneous linear equations. They can be solved with factorizing a and forward and backward substitution. I'm going to assume that you know how to do that. Nonlinear equations typically can't be solved in that manner. They need iterative algorithms. We're going to develop the Newton-Raphson algorithm. Newton-Raphson needs an initial guess to get started, and then we iteratively improve it. We're going to focus on issues related to that improvement that involves linearization of the function. It turns out that that development's very important in understanding formulations and approximations in power flow and electricity markets. So that's primarily why we're studying it here. As an example of nonlinear simultaneous equations, look at the figure I've shown in this picture. I've got two curves. The upper curve, it looks like a U, is the set of points that satisfies G1 of x equals 0. The lower curve satisfies G2 of x equals 0. If I want to set both of them equal to 0 simultaneously, the only points that satisfy it are the intersections of those two sets. I've denoted those by x star and x double star. So sometimes when I've got two solutions of a problem, I'll indicate the multiple solutions with multiple stars. In general, a simultaneous equations problem could have no solutions, one solution, or multiple solutions. Here's another example. In this case, I've got a quadratic function as one of my entries of g. And setting that equal to 0 defines the set that's drawn as a circle, the set of x's such that g1 of x is equal to 0. The other set defines a line. And again, you can see there's two intersections. As a third example, I've got a function there. It's just a very simple function. Dimension of x is 1, and the dimension of x is 1. I'll call that a simultaneous equation, even though there's really only one equation. And by inspection, if you do a graph of it, draw a graph of it, you'll see that the only solution is x star is equal to 1. In order to solve such nonlinear equations, when they have a dimension that's too big to be able to figure out the solution by drawing a graph or by inspection, we need a general approach. That general approach is the Newton-Raphson algorithm. And its goal is to find a solution, x star, to the equations gx equal to 0. I'm going to assume from now on that g has the same number of entries as x. So g goes from Rn into Rn. This, that means it has the same number of variables as equations. And I hope it's intuitive to you that it's at least possible that there's a solution. We're already using subscripts to distinguish the entries of x. We're going to create a sequence of iterates. I need another way to distinguish things besides subscripts. So I'm going to use superscripts, and I'm going to use superscripts in parentheses to indicate the iteration count. I'm going to define an initial guess, or come up with an initial guess, at my solution. I'll call it x superscript 0. If I were lucky, it would satisfy my equations. But in general, I won't be that lucky. In general, g of x naught will be not equal to 0. And what I want to do is create an update, a better approximation of the solution. Let me call it x superscript 1, such that g of x1 is equal to 0. x1 will differ from x0 by a change. I'll denote changes with a delta in front of the symbol. So delta x0 is the change from x0 to create x1. To set up the Taylor approximation, or the, excuse me, to set up the Newton-Raphson 
update, I need to explain the Taylor approximation. That's easiest to do for a scalar function first. So let me take the first entry of g. g1 evaluated at x1 is equal to g1 evaluated at x0 plus delta x0. I can approximate that by taking a Taylor approximation of g1 about x0. What will happen is I need to add to g1 a bunch of terms, one for each entry in x. You can imagine starting at x0, moving out in the x sub 1 direction by an amount delta x1, delta x subscript 1. How would we approximate that? Well, we could calculate the slope of g1 with respect to x1 and multiply that slope by delta x1. Similarly, we could move in the x sub subscript 2, the x subscript 3, and so on up to x subscript n directions. If I add those terms together, and if I collect the entries to g1 by the xk into a row vector, I can write that out as in the last line of equation 2.6 g1 of x1 is approximately equal to g1 of x0 plus to g1 by dx, evaluated at x0, times delta x0. That approximately equal to, you should think of that as meaning the difference between the expressions to the right and the left is small compared to the norm of delta x0. The norm means the length of a vector. And as I think I already said, that gives me the first order Taylor approximation. For a partially differentiable G1 with continuous partial derivatives, first order Taylor approximation approximates G1. It actually produces a t uh, corresponds or represents a plane that's tangential to the graph of the function. Here's an example. Function shown up there. The function is that curving part of the graph. If you think of that function as your hand and imagine that your hand is curving down, and think of your knuckle as one of those points, and then take your other hand, lay it flat, but touch that knuckle. The flat hand is the Taylor approximation to your curved hand, which is the function. And as you can see, if you look closely in between your two hands, as you get closer and closer to the point about which you're calculating the Taylor approximation, the approximation gets better. So as an example, we could start out with the function I've shown there, have an x0 and a change. We could evaluate g1 and x0, evaluate the partial derivative, evaluate the Taylor approximation, and then you should compare it to the actual value of the function. Whenever you see some printing in red, that's an exercise that I would ask a student in class to solve. Well, so far we've considered a scalar function, but we need to consider vector functions. And we can actually generalize Taylor's theorem and have a first order Taylor approximation of g about x0. g of x0 plus delta x0 is approximately equal to g of x0 plus to g by x. That's an n by n matrix of partial derivatives times delta x0. And again, that first order Taylor approximation represents a plane. Actually, it's a hyperplane. Situation is pretty hard to visualize, though, for a vector function. So think of it as individual approximations to the scalar functions. That matrix of partial derivatives is called the Jacobian. We we'll usually denote it by J. And when I want to emphasize that I'm thinking about a function, I'll use the following notation. I'll write J, open parentheses, bullet, closed parentheses. I'm just emphasizing that this is a function, not a vector, not a particular value of a vector, but a function. In this case, matrix-valued function. And 
Most of the time, I will use J for Jacobian or, this, or J sometimes for a submatrix of the Jacobian. We can rewrite our first order Taylor approximation using the symbol Jaco of, for the Jacobian as G1 of X1 is approximately equal to G of X0 plus J of X0 times delta X. If we set the right hand side of 2.7 to 0, that approximates the left hand side, then we'll have approximately found an update, delta X0, that makes the left hand side approximately equal to 0. Setting it equal to 0 is shown in 2.8. Let's be careful here about what we know and what we don't know. We're starting with an initial guess, x0. We can evaluate g. If we were lucky, that would be equal to 0, but most of the time it's not. We can evaluate the Jacobian, and we can plug x0 into that as well. What I now want to do is find x1, x superscript 1, that's a better approximation to my solution. How am I going to do that? I'm going to find the change delta x0 that's just right to make the linear approximation, to make the first order Taylor approximation to g equal to 0. To do that, I set the right hand side of 2.7 to 0. Rearranging, I get 2.8. And the reason why I rearrange it in that manner is to clarify that on the left hand side, I've got a known matrix, a square matrix, an unknown vector, delta x naught, and a known right hand side, minus g of x naught. If you know how to solve linear equations, you can solve that. That'll give us x1. If that isn't a solution, we need to find x2, x3, and so on. So I'm going to think of needing to do this iteratively over multiple iterations. And for any particular iteration, let me denote a particular iteration by x superscript nu, the Greek letter nu, nu. Then I can write down the general update as 2.9 and 2.10. So they're called the Newton-Raphson update. And the resulting delta x is called the Newton-Raphson step, step direction. And I use it, I use delta x nu to add to x nu to calculate x nu plus 1. We keep on doing that. We can't do it forever. We do it until a stopping criterion is satisfied. It's got some problems. We need to calculate a matrix of partial derivatives. We can find that the linear equations don't have a solution. And even if they do have a solution, they may not converge. For that reason, various approximations and variations have been developed. They're aimed at reducing the computational effort and dealing with the possibility that the iterates either don't work, we can't solve for the update, or the iterates fail to form a convergence sequence. One variation, it's an extreme, is to perform just one update from some suitable initial guess. We're going to develop this variation because in the context of power flow, it's one way to interpret the approximation of the transmission system that's used in many electricity market models. And even when we're trying to do a full nonlinear solution, that linearization sheds light on the typical approach to dealing with nonlinearities that involve decomposition. So, in this chapter, we considered a solution of simultaneous nonlinear optimization problems. We considered linearization of a function, and we developed the Newton Raphson algorithm. I based this section on chapters of my book on optimization, formulation, and algorithms for engineering systems. There are a few homework exercises. You can solve a linear equation, you can solve a nonlinear equation, and explore the successive iterates generated by Newton Raphson.